Estamos grabando la clase del día viernes 10 de septiembre del grupo 2 UDLA. Y eh, las clases anteriores las subí hace un ratito, así que ya está todo a su disposición. Sí, Álvaro, ahí después me escribe un correo para que te deje presente, porfa. Eh, universidades, universidades UDLA, universidades UDLA Grammar 2, universidades UDLA Grammar 2, Coordination, Independent and Dependent Clauses. Ya, antes de comenzar con esto, eh, ¿qué es lo que hemos hablado? Hasta este momento, hemos hablado de Simple Sentence. Una simple sentence está hecha de una independent clause. Independent clause. Y si hablamos de independent clause, hablamos de dependent clause. Dependent clause. Ambas dos están hechas de valency patterns. Patterns. Cuando hablamos de dependent clause, hablamos también de eh, subordination. ¿Cierto? Subordination. Y cuando hablamos de subordination, hablamos de conjunctions. Una vez que hablamos de subordination, subordination y conjunctions, hablamos de complex sentence. Revisamos muy a rápida, muy por encima, un poquito de coordination, por lo que también revisamos muy a rápida y por encima compound sentence. Y eso es lo que hemos hecho. Debería reconocer todo eso en nombre. ¿Ya? Avancemos. Antes de comenzar con eh, la revisión de TPPT, tengo que agradecer al profesor Leandro Silva, eh, colega de la UNCE, también trabajó en la UDLA, en este mismo, en este mismo curso, eh, nos prestó este PPT maravilloso que hizo él. ¿Ya? Sí, muchas gracias, Leo. Sentences and clauses. A sentence is a grammatical structure made up of one or more clauses. Okay, so we know that um, sentences as the top element within the grammatical hierarchy, then they are composed of clauses. Second point, a clause is a group of words. I don't like that. A clause is a group of phrases with its own subject and verb. I would change the entire definition. What I would say is a clause is a group of phrases and one of those phrases must be a verb phrase, right? Because when you're saying, when you're saying that um, a clause is a group of words. Yeah, it is true, but it is true because of the phrase, of the phrases that are, that are present inside of the clause and that they have subject and verb is because of the presence of the verb, right? So, so the example, the woman is beautiful then, uh, what I see is a simple sentence created by one clause That clause is created by phrases. The phrases are the woman, the other one is, and the last one, beautiful, right? Um, the second example, who was wearing glasses, right? I can see another clause. In this case, I can't see a sentence. Later on, I'll let you know why. Uh, I can see a clause, and this clause is created by phrases. These phrases are who, The other one was wearing, and the final one, glasses, right? Um, then, it is different, third, third point, it is different from a phrase, that is to say, clauses are different from phrases in that a phrase does not include a subject and a verb relationship, right? Okay, um, we have discussed till this point the idea, well, we, we have been discussing the idea of the grammatical hierarchy since the beginning of this year, and in that Uh, grammatical hierarchy, we have that um, phrases will create clauses, but what's the difference between them? Well, one of the main differences between a phrase and a clause is the fact that it, within clauses you have subject, verb, object, adverbial, and complement. That is to say, a valency pattern. 
Um, meanwhile, inside of phrases, you, you don't have that. What you have is the relationship between the head and modifiers, right? So they are obviously quite different, right? Uh, so all over again. It is diff a clause is different from a phrase in respect that a phrase does not include a subject and the verb relationship. It is true. It is true. However, however, there are some phrases which might have a clause inside of them. But that clause, that is to say, the relationship between subject and verb inside of the clause, it is not at the phrase level because it is just a modifier. We're going to see that later on. Um, fourth point. Okay, there are two types of clauses, right? We have the independent clause and we have the dependent clause. We have discussed this quite a long time so far. Okay, the independent clause can stand or make sense on their own. I don't like that definition because what makes sense is sort of different from everyone, uh, right? What I would say is the second point. An independent clause can be its own sentence, but very often they are part of larger structures and they are also called main clauses. What I would say is this. I would say that an independent clause is a clause, obviously, which makes sense, obviously, but um, it, have, it has enough context, I would say. That is to say, you can read it and you can understand what the clause is expressing by the by the uh, by just reading the the clause right you don't need extra information so let's take those examples i mean the example and let's try to analyze it okay so what we have is this hi and joy Okay, good. So the, these holes are called kettles and the holes look just like pots. So if the teacher asked me for a syntactic analysis of this, I would do the following. The very first stuff I'm going to say is the fact that there is a conjunction in the middle of them. Um, therefore, I have this, support, this coordinating conjunction. We discussed that last lesson. This is a coordinating conjunction which is linking two elements. These elements are the clauses. These holes are called kettles and the holes look just like pots. In this respect, then I would say that um, here I have a clause and then here I have another clause, right? Right. Then um, the very first clause as every single clause is created around a verb phrase, therefore, there are phrases inside of it. So I'm going to read it and look for the, ma the for the verb phrase, right? These holes are called, and that's it, are called. Who are called these holes, and how are they called? They are called kettles, right? So what I have then, I have an independent clause. Dependent clause. And inside of that, I have three different phrases, right? The first one of them is a noun phrase subject. The other one is a verb phrase verb. And the other one is a noun phrase object. Someone is writing. Uh, sí, Ignacia, me escribe un correo, porfa, para poder ponerla presente. And then the common analysis, right? Determine a pre noun head auxiliary verb pre verb head noun head and the other one is another independent clause the pen then clause okay another sorry another independent clause created by i don't know just take a look at the verbs Look, just like, okay, here we have something different, but it's pr practically the same idea, right? Three things, a noun, phrase, subject, a verb, phrase, verb, look, just like pods. 
I'm not sure about like, but I imagine this is something like, just like, this is something like a um, prepositional phrase, perhaps. I don't know. It doesn't matter for our analysis. Well, the idea is this. The idea is, the idea is, number one, number one, the idea of coordinating conjunctions, coordinating conjunctions, right? They link, they add clauses together. Second idea, the idea that independent clauses can be linked by, an, by a coordinating conjunction. Right? And obviously that clauses are created out of phrases. On the other hand, what we have is um, dependent clauses. Now, dependent clauses, they cannot stand on their own, so they depend on another clause. <clears throat> well, why? Basically because a dependent clause, then you don't have enough context, therefore you need more information. As a consequence of needing more information, then they can stand on their own and they must be attached. They must be linked. This might, they must be joined to another clause, right? In order to gain that context. Therefore, second point, they are considered sentence fragments. They are not a sentence, but they are part of a sentence. Uh, they are also known as subordinate clauses. Okay, I agree and don't agree that much with that idea. Um, I would say that a dependent clause, one of the one of the different types of dependent clauses are subordinate clauses. Noelia, you raise your hand. Sí, eh, profe, en el caso anterior, eh, el balance pattern, ¿cómo quedaría o simplemente no habría que indicarlo? Como en el dependent clause que había que ponerle si era... Adverbial y todo eso. Ahí está. No hay que indicarlo no, al final del ejercicio, como uh, lo hacíamos anteriormente. No, porque, o sea, de hecho nunca se debe indicar al final, solo lo colocaba yo arriba del ejercicio para que fuera mucho más evidente. ¿Por qué no se coloca nunca? Porque se encuentra dentro del mismo análisis, como puedes ver en la parte que está subrayada amarillo. Sí. Ahí está el Valencia Pattern ya y el resto era solo colocarlo arriba, pero porque nosotros lo colocábamos arriba. Ah, ya. Gracias, profesor. Ok. Ok, dependent clauses all over again. They cannot stand on their own, so they depend on another clause. That is true. Therefore, they are considered sentence fragments and not a huge, a huge sentence. That is true, also true. They are also known as subordinate clauses. I would say that uh, subordinate clauses is one of the different dependent clauses you can find. So here we have something, uh, again, uh, another example. Uh, a really big example, but we're going to use it anyway. Okay, so the internet, which started out as a means for military and academic types to share documents, has become a household necessity. The very first thing I'm going to say is that um, as there is one dependent clause, and as there is one independent clause, this thing is called complex sentence. That's the very first stuff I'm going to say. The second thing I'm going to say is um, that I need to look for the verb phrase, right? But not any verb phrase. I need to look for the verb phrase that is inside of the independent clause. So I'm going to read all the thing and looking for the main, main verb phrase. The internet, which started out as a means for military and academic types to share documents, has become a household necessity. And I believe the main verb phrase or the verb phrase that comes in the independent clause is has become. How am I going to prove it? I'm going to prove it by uh, looking for the subject now. Who has become a household or what has become a household necessity? The internet, the internet, right? So it has become a household necessity. Yeah, and with that thing, I'm saying that the subject begins in D and it ends in documents, right? Um, what ha has, has become, has become what? A household necessity, okay. Now the easiest part. 
household necessity household necessity i believe this is a noun phrase acting as an object has become is the verb phrase verb and then the internet which whatever and all the very huge stuff we have is a noun phrase subject why am i saying this is a noun phrase subject first of all is the doer of the action therefore is a subject and second thing as I can replace the whole thing by a pronoun, then I will I will say this is a noun phrase, right? In the analysis, then I will have the, which is the determiner pre-modifier, internet, right, is our noun here. And then I have which started out as a means for military and academic types to share documents. I'm gonna change colors because this is the dependent clause, right? In this case, this dependent clause is is inside of a noun phrase right so here we have the dependent clause now what happens if i read which started out as a means for military and academic types to share documents on its own i would say the very first thing is i don't have enough context so i don't understand what you're saying right uh, in comparison to the internet has become a household necessity, which is absolutely clear. Therefore, and because of that lack of context, uh, context I would say that the, the clause, the WH clause, the, the clause uh, which is inside of that noun phrase is a dependent clause attached to a noun phrase, right? Right. As every single clause, there are phrases inside of it. So I think started out is a verb phrase, which is the noun phrase started out, started out as what? As a means for military and academic types to share documents. And here I have a clause inside of a clause, right? That's my subordinating conjunction. As a means for military and academic types, to share documents, I think, I believe. Well, the important thing with this example is the fact that dependent clauses are connected or are linked or combined with independent clauses, but also with other dependent clauses. Here we have further examples. Uh, probably they won't make, they won't make much sense. Okay. Dígame. ¿Le puedo hacer una consulta? Por supuesto, dígame. Eh, en la dependent clause, ¿cuántas pueden haber una dentro de la otra? Hasta el infinito. Ah, pueden haber varias. O sea, podrían haber dos mil. Ah, ya. Nadie habla es que así. Nad <risa> nadie, nadie en verdad habla así, pero piensa en que cada vez que en español tú dices por qué estás haciendo una dependent clause adentro de otra. Ejemplo. Yo creo en esto porque bla 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 porque bla 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 porque bla 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 porque y cada porque está dentro de la cláusula anterior. Ok, profe, gracias. Ok. Here we have more examples of dependent clauses. Uh, on the left column we have the dependent ones and on the right we have the independent ones. Ok. So in the left column what we have is if the boss tells joke if the boss tells a joke, then what we have is something with a lack of context, right? We need to know, we, we need further information. Now, let's compare that with the one on the right. He is not joking, right? He is not joking. I have a, a full understanding uh, because of the context, right? Uh, second example, when the Great Fire of London took place, Right when the Great Fire of London took place, right? We need more information. Let's compare that with the one on the right. Half of London was burned, right? Finally, we have before the Romans had elections. Uh, in comparison to people who had to wear togas. Uh, the the interesting stuff is the fact that perhaps the element which um, creates, I would say. Yeah, the element which creates this sense of not knowing, this not, not knowing sense, this uncertainty, 
is the presence of a subordinating conjunction at the very beginning of that of those clauses, right? So um, is the word if in the first example, when in the second, and before in the third. Uh, those are the words which are not um, letting us be sure that we have the entire information, perhaps, I would say, right? Right. Further info. Independent clauses, on the one hand, okay, they are of different types. They are not just of one type. Uh, you can find declarative clauses, uh, which are basically statements. Like, for example, I play football, you don't play tennis and stuff, right? They have a subject predicate structure, that is to say they have a valency pattern. Um, also, you can have interrogative clauses. Instead of independent clauses, interrogative clauses. Interrogative clauses can be of three different types, right? We have WH questions. They are called in that way because of the WH word with which uh, they begin with. Um, then, the, then you have yes, no questions because the answer is a yes and no, right? And basically they are done uh, by using the verb to be, like in are you happy? And finally, the third <coughs> type of interrogative clause is the alternative question where you, the answer is because of the answer. It's called alternative question because you need to choose between different alternatives. Then you have also inside of independent clauses, you can have exclamative clauses because they convey exclamative meaning. Like for example, the ones that are in the slide, I won't say much about that. And finally, the perhaps the rarest, not in terms of frequency, but in terms of um, formation building, I would say, is the imperative clause because they are different from the rest of the, uh, they are very different from the rest of the independent clauses because they don't have a subject, right? Therefore, they break this valency pattern rule. <clears throat> Imperatives are orders, right? So it's when you yell at someone and you say, stand up, and then the person stand up, right? Stands up, right? That person. Um, and as you can see in those examples, they don't have subjects. And that's it. Any questions about the things we have discussed so far? No? Okay, good. Let's move on. La voz es cortita, Pani. Okay, uh, you also have this, another PPT PowerPoint. So um, I'm going to try to review it really fast and easy till the moment in which we need to stop for the analysis, okay? Okay, um, so uh, the previous slide was dealing with the idea of uh, independent and dependent clauses, that is to say with the idea of simple sentence. Let's remember that a simple sentence is an independent clause. De a dependent clause, <clears throat> cannot be a simple sentence. Why not? Because you need more information. Therefore, you need another element, right? So what you are going to have is a complex sentence. A complex sentence, as, the, as you can read, um, is an independent clause joined by one or more dependent clauses. When I say more is, I don't know, till the end of times, is ad eternum, I would say. Right, we don't have the the exact number of how many of them can be placed inside or next to uh, an independent clause. Right, a subordinating conjunction begins the dependent clause. Every single dependent clause then will begin with a subordinating conjunction um, of different types. Right, but we're going to review them later on. Then a dependent clause that begins a sentence must be followed by a comma. That is to say. Uh, not all of them, but a very broad and big group of uh, independent clauses are movable. That is to say, uh, you can place them in different places inside of a sentence, right? Um, therefore, that specific type of 
of uh, dependent clause, once you move them at the very beginning of the sentence, you must separate the dependent clause from the independent clause by using a comma right after the end of the dependent clause. We're going to see that on, also, I mean, we have seen this before. And uh, finally, a dependent clause has a subject and a verb, but it doesn't make sense on its own. And we know that. All over again, it's because of the context, right? You don't have enough of it. And here we have examples. We already discussed them. I won't say much about them. Compound complex, we won't deal with that yet. So take it easy. And here is the point where we are going to begin today. Dependent clauses. Okay, we have discussed this, so I'm just going to read it and add some further notes on it. A subordinate clause is a clause that supports ideas stated in the main clause. Okay, you have to be careful with that. <clears throat> I would say that subordinate clause is a name given to a group of dependent clauses, right? So what I would say is we have a very big and broad uh, and, and really big, in fact, group of clauses which we're going to call um, dependent clauses and among those dependent clauses inside of them you have another group and, and a smaller a smaller group called subordinate clauses because there are more dependent clauses types right okay second point subordinate clauses are also dependent on main clauses we know that right because you don't have enough context and would be otherwise incomprehensible without them. That is true. Let's remember that a dependent clause is considered to be a sentence fragment, is a part of a sentence, not the sentence. Examples. We have three different examples, right? Because she was sick, who was in the middle of the road, and whatever you do. And then you can see how those different dependent clauses are different in the way in which they are being written not because of the words, right, but because of the pattern. But we're going to review them later on. Okay, this process, and this is really, really, really relevant, the process of joining a dependent clause to an independent clause, we're going to call it subordination. Write that down, subordination, the process of joining or putting together a dependent and an independent clause. It's sort of difficult because um, it's sort of difficult because if you don't know the uh, subordinate conjunctions, then it is it's quite dif difficult for you to realize where it, where the dependent clause is. And on the other hand, uh, it's uh, it's a lot of uh, reading comprehension thing. You need to read and comprehend what you're reading. So I'm going to read it again. There are two kinds of clauses. Okay, we know that. Main clauses, yes, and subordinate clauses, yeah, dependent clauses, yes. A main clause, okay, also called independent clause, yes, we know that, can stand by itself and make sense, we know that because of the context. A subordinate clause, yes, also called a dependent clause, yeah, we know, we know that, is a group of words, no, it's a group of phrases, and those phrases are created by words that contains a subject and a predicate, that is true, because every single, every, every independent and dependent clauses, they require a verb phrase. And once, once you have a verb phrase, you have a predicate and the subject. Uh, but depends on the main clause to complete its meaning. Yeah, we know that. So both examples. We will not leave the house unless it stops raining. And as you can see, the first example is the main or independent clause, right? We will not leave the house where the context is sufficient for us in order to realize the action um, entailed um, uh, related to that clause. And in the second one, unless it stops raining, it is also quite clear that we don't have enough context, therefore we need more information. In that respect, by a process of subordination, we're going to create a complex sentence by joining the subordinate clause unless it stops raining to the main or independent clause we will not leave the house right right any problem any question no no profit okay therefore a subordinate clause also called dependent clause we know that will begin with a subordinate conjunction we know that or a relative pronoun we didn't know that okay relative pronouns 
or will contain both a subject and, and will contain both a subject and a verb. I would say that a dependent clause will contain all of the possible balancey patterns out there. So you can have subject, verb, object, subject, verb, complement, and so on and so forth. This combination of words will not form a complete sentence. Yeah, we know because uh, you don't have enough meaning, right? It will instead make a reader want additional information to finish the thought. And all over again, I already said it. I believe, I, I think my personal opinion is that um, the sense or, or, or the necessity for more information comes from the usage of the relative uh, pronoun or the subordinate conjunction. As a summary, there you have all the subordinate conjunctions or subordinating conjunctions. And as you can see, there are some of them quite easy. I mean, the, some of them are very easy to, uh, to remember, right? But there are some others which are more, more difficult uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, please be very careful with the ones created by multi-word units. Like for example, even though in order that uh, provided that rather than and I believe those are those are all right now. Uh, be careful with them, but because even though they are composed of more than one item, that is to say, even though it has two items, they are considered one single lexeme. Therefore, even though it, even though uh, it it is written by, with with two words quotation marks, but in fact it's 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 just one word. And that word is a subordinating conjunction. The very same happens with in order that, right? Even though in order that is written by using three items, they are just one single lexeme. Another <clears throat> important thing is uh, please pay attention to the WH words at the very end of that list. Um, you have a very broad group of them when, whenever, where, whereas, wherever, whether, while, while, and why, right? Um, there's a very broad group. Finally, you, we have the relative pronouns, that, which, whichever, who, whoever, whom, whose, whosever, and whomever. Um, we're going to review them once we start analyzing all the different, all the different um, clauses, okay? Any question? ¿Me preguntas? No, maravilloso. Profe, no, profe. Ya, maravilloso. Vamos a parar 15 minutos para ir a tomar solcito. Y, eh, y eso, y volvemos a las 13, a las 14, 15, y comenzamos con esta parte, esta última parte de Complex Sentences. Ya, volvemos a las 14, 15. Um, noun clause, ok uh, lo que vamos a ver ahora es hemos hablado un montón de independent and dependent clauses y ahora vamos a saber, la, bueno la analizamos también y hemos hablado harto de ello y ahora vamos a ver para qué sirven ya yeah. uh, a subordinate dependent clause may function as a noun, an adjective or an adverb in sentence on the basis of their function in a sentence, subordinate clauses can be divided into the following types. All over again, when we say dependent clause, some other people will call them subordinate clause. Okay? Okay. Therefore, dependent clauses or subordinate clauses can be divided into three groups. Noun clauses, adjective clauses, adverb clauses. It is also important to point out the fact that in certain grammars or in some other places, they receive another names. Like for example, noun clauses, they are called nominal clauses. Adjective, adjective clauses, they are called um, relative clauses in some other places. And finally, adverb clauses are called subordinate clauses. Okay. Noun clauses, <clears throat> Ahí está. Noun clauses 
A dependent clause that functions as a noun in a sentence is called a noun clause. A noun clause performs same functions like a noun in a sentence. Okay, now the very first question then is, which are the functions that nouns perform inside of a sentence, right? That is to say, they are subjects and objects, okay? Please write that thing down. Noun phrases, now inside of clauses, as a valency pattern, noun phrases, they perform the role of subject and object. That is to say, the example, what he did made a problem for his family. What he did was a problem for his family. And then I'm going to analyze it. The very first thing I'm going to say is the fact that we're seeing a complex sentence. Therefore, there is subordination inside of this sentence. The second thing I'm going to say is looking for the uh, verb phrase, right? So I'm going to take a look at it. What he did made a problem for his family. And then I'm going to say that um, made is the verb phrase, right? Now, the question is who made a problem or what made a problem for his family? What he did, what he did, what he did is a clause. How do I know that? I know that because it has a verb phrase inside of it and it begins with a subordinate conjunction. As it is a clause, I'm going to separate it from the rest of the sentence by using a square brackets. Then, as I said, clause inside of it, there are phrases and I'm going to separate them. As they are phrases, I'm going to use round brackets. I'm going to separate the verb phrase, did, and the subject. Okay, then uh, made, what did it made? Made what? A problem for his, a problem, it made a problem. To whom? For his family, right? Right. Now, what's the name for the very first thing? Is a noun clause. Acting as what? As a subject, right? Now, what's inside of it? Inside of it, I have my subordinating conjunction, what? Then, I have a noun phrase subject made out of the pronoun he, pronoun head, and finally a verb phrase verb did with the verb head did. Next to that, I have the verb phrase verb made, which is composed of the verb head made. Then I have a problem. A problem is a noun phrase acting as an object, the direct object, right? because it answers the question, what? A problem, A is a determiner, three modifier, and problem is the noun head. Finally, for his family is a prepositional phrase because it begins with this preposition. And then as every single prepositional phrase, it is followed by the noun phrase complement his family, which is created out of two element, elements, his, the determiner, pre-modifier, and family, the noun head, okay? The important issue here is the following. The subordinate clause, the dependent clause, is called noun clause. Why? Because it is used as a subject, right? Any problem? Alguna consulta? Profe, Dígame. Eh, para identificar es, eh, esto, esa noun clause y diferenciarla de dependent clause, eh, tendría, ¿tendría que ser como la misma estructura, seguir este mismo patrón o puede haber otro? Claro, mira, lo primero, una dependent clause, para aclarar la duda, ¿ya? Una dependent clause es igual a lo que la gente en este PowerPoint hace un símil entre dependent clause y subordinate clause. ¿Ya? Cuando dicen subordinate clause, ellos dicen dependent clause. Primera cosa. Adentro de las subordinate o dependent clauses hay tres tipos de cláusulas 
o se, o en otras palabras, la dependent clause se subdivide en tres tipos de cláusulas. La primera es la noun clause. ¿Cachai? ¿Qué quiere decir eso? Que no hay una diferenciación entre dependent clause y noun clause debido a que las noun clauses son dependent clauses. ¿Cachai? Eso es lo primero. Lo segundo, que la noun clause, como toda dependent clause, comienza con una subordinating conjunction. Y si no parte con una subordinating conjunction, parte con una cosa que se llama relative pronoun. ¿Ya? ¿Ya? ¿Cuál es mi subordinating conjunction? La voy a marcar en rojo. What? ¿Ya? Eso es lo primero. Segundo. Como es una cláusula, como es una cláusula, porque se llama noun clause, cláusula sustantiva, como es una cláusula, tiene un valency pattern. Porque todas las cláusulas tienen valency pattern. ¿Cuál es el valency pattern? Te lo voy a marcar en amarillo. Ahí está. Entonces, el valency pattern de la que tenemos en el ejemplo ahí es SB. ¿Sí? Sí. Tercero. Como es una dependent clause, es solo un fragmento de oración. ¿Sí? ¿Qué quiere decir eso? Que cumple el rol, su rol es ser sujeto de una oración más grande. ¿Cuál es la oración más grande? Te la marco en morado. La oración más grande es todo esto. ¿Cachai? Entonces, el valency pattern de la oración más grande es sujeto, verbo, objeto directo, y este de aquí es un objeto indirecto. ¿Cachai? Y la noun clause es solo el sujeto de esto. No sé si entiende la idea. Y ahí queda mucho más claro. Perfecto. Más Gracias. dudas. ¿Alguien más alguna duda? Ya. Entonces dijimos que una noun clause can be a subject. Ahí estamos, ¿cierto? But it can also be an object. He knows that he will pass the test. He knows that he will pass the test. ¿Cuál es el verbo aquí? Knows. ¿Quién sabe? Él sabe. ¿Qué es lo que sabe? That he will pass the test. Aquí, como es una cláusula, cuadrado. ¿Cierto? Noun phrase, subject, verb phrase, verb, noun head, verb head, that he will pass the test. ¿Cuál es el verb phrase? Will pass. ¿Cierto? ¿Quién will pass? Él. ¿Qué will pass? The test. ¿Sí? Esta cosa es una noun clause actuando como object, porque es el que recibe la acción, es el que del verbo. Analizo. Ese that es mi subordinating conjunction. Ese he es mi noun phrase subject, hecho del pronoun head, he. Will pass es mi verb phrase, verb, hecho de will. Y pass. Y the test es mi noun phrase object hecho de determiner premodifier D y test noun head. ¿Sí? Sí. Lo vuelvo a decir en rojo. La oración más grande es SBO, donde ese O está hecho por una noun clause, ¿cierto? Y esa noun clause tiene un valency pattern SBO también adentro. Be very careful with the following idea. A noun clause is considered to be a noun clause because it plays the role of a subject or an object. Right? All over again. A noun clause 
is considered to be a noun clause because it plays the role of a subject or an object in a sentence. ¿Alguna duda? No, profe. Bacán. Avancemos. Adjective clauses. Adjective clauses are dependent clauses that functions as an adjective in a sentence. Therefore, they are called adjective clauses. An adjective clause works like an adjective in a sentence. The function of an adjective is to modify, that is to say, describe a noun or a pronoun. Similarly, a noun clause modifies a noun or a pronoun, right? Now, let's take this example. He wears a shirt which looks nice. Okay, I'm going to provide a syntactic analysis out of this. So the very first thing I'm going to do is looking for the verb phrase, right? So the verb phrase is wears, right? Who wears, he wears. What does he wear? A shirt which looks nice, but this is a phrase not a clause. He is a noun phrase subject, whereas is a verb phrase verb, and a shirt which looks nice is a noun phrase acting as an object. But why? Because shirt is the noun shirt. Why? Because I can replace the whole thing by, a, by using a pronoun. I can say he wears this or he wears that, right? I'm going to provide the whole thing now. He is a pronoun head. Wears is a verb head. A is a determiner pre-modifier. And then which looks nice is a clause. In this case, the adjective clause is acting as a post modifier of the noun head shirt because it is provided information about shirt, right? As I said, adjective clause, I had to state the phrases. Looks is the verb, which is the subject, and how does it look? Nice, right? So I have three things. Which is the noun phrase subject, right? Made out of the relative pronoun, pronoun head. Then looks is the verb phrase verb, made out of the verb head. And then nice is an adjective phrase acting as a subject complement made out of the adjective head nice. Resumen. Una adjective clause está adentro de una noun phrase. De nuevo. Una adjective clause está adentro de una noun phrase actuando como post modifier o complement, cualquiera de las dos. ¿Qué significa eso? Lo vamos a ver al tiro. ¿Alguna duda hasta aquí antes de avanzar? No, vamos. Here we have more examples. I met the boy who had helped me where who had helped me is the adjective clause, which is modifying the noun head boy, right? And so on and so forth with all the rest of them, right? I want you to pay attention to number three. The book which I like is helpful in preparation for test. I'm going to... Okay, the book which I like is helpful in preparation for test. So I'm going to look for the verb phrase. This one. It is helpful in preparation for test. That is to say, this whole stuff is the subject. This is a noun phrase subject. This is the verb phrase verb. Is what? Helpful. 
right? This is an adjective, phrase, subject, complement. For what, right? The reason or the, the, the effect in preparation for test, this is a prepositional phrase adverbial. The book, B is a determiner pre-modifier. Book is a noun head. And then I have which I like, which is the adjective clause. I separate it by using square brackets because we separate clauses by using square brackets. Then like is the verb phrase. I is the subject and which is the subordinating conjunction. What's the name for this? The name is adjective clause post modifier. And, it's and it is created by the word which, which is a subordinating conjunction. Then I, a noun phrase subject made out of the pronoun head I. Finally, like, the verb phrase verb made out of the verb head like. Then all the common thing. This is a verb head. This is an adjective head. In preparation for test is a prepositional phrase. Therefore, in the first preposition is the preposition head and is followed as every single prepositional phrase by a noun phrase complement, which is made out of preparation, the noun head, and then another prepositional phrase, post modifier for test, which has four as every single prepositional phrase, preposition head, and then followed by the noun phrase complement test. Noun phrase complement test and test is the noun head. Be very careful with this. En amarillo, which looks nice. En amarillo, which I like. En el análisis, adjective clause, post modifier, adjective clause, post modifier. Son iguales. ¿Cómo están hechas? ¿Cómo están hechas? No son iguales. En la número uno, vamos a escribir en verde, en esta, which es un pronoun. Ahí se ve. En esta, which es una subordinating conjunction. Ahí se ve. La diferencia está, por favor, mucha atención, la diferencia está en que en la segunda oración, which I like, tengo un pronombre, I. Which I like, está I. Tengo el pronombre personal, ese es mi sujeto. Ese es mi sujeto, I like. En la primera oración, no tengo pronombre y parto directo con which, which looks. En ese lugar entonces, which es el pronombre. Ese es el motivo de que en la primera oración, which sea un pronombre, por lo tanto, la noun phrase subject, y en la segunda oración, which es una subordinating conjunction y nada más. ¿Queda claro? Sí, profe. Ya, yeah, perfecto. <coughs> Avanzamos. Adjective phrases can be of two types. Okay. Adjective phrases can be of two types. They can be restrictive, that is to say obligatory, or they can be non-restrictive, that is to say optional. Okay. Which means this. Relative clauses can be restrictive or non-restrictive restrictive clauses, that is to say, adjective clauses, which are obligatory, limits the meaning of preceding noun or pronoun. It provides essential information to understand the sentence. Therefore, si la borro, si la borro, la oración pierde sentido. A non-restrictive clause, that is to say, an adjective clause, non-restrictive, a non-restrictive adjective clause, 
tells us something about the preceding noun or pronoun, but does not limit the meaning of preceding noun or pronoun, right? It is not essential information, so it is extra information, so it can be omitted, it can be erased without affecting the meaning. And most importantly, it is written between commas. An old person dresses, sorry, an old person who dresses like a teenager is object of ridicule. An old person dr who dresses like a teenager is object of ridicule. So we're going to analyze it. Is, is my verb phrase verb, verb head, and here we have is, object of ridicule this is object is a noun i think noun phrase object i i believe a uh, noun head followed by of preposition therefore prepositional phrase post modifier post m with the preposition of as a head and then ridicule with the noun phrase complement ridicule and ridicule should be a noun head the subject he is object of ridicule she is object of ridicule therefore this is a noun phrase right i can replace it by a pronoun and the terminal right old adjective right person noun and here we have our adjectival clause or adjective clause who dresses like a teenager, okay? Verb, subject, who dresses like this. Creo que es una prepositional phrase. Like, es una preposición, creo, no estoy seguro, hay que buscar un diccionario. Adjective clause pero la puedo borrar o no? An old person who dresses like a teenager is object of ridicule. Ya, ahí está puesta. Ahora la voy a borrar. An old person is object of ridicule. No, pues no se puede borrar porque significa, cambia el significado completamente. Por lo tanto, es obligatoria. Por lo tanto, es un complement. No post modifier. Y ahora hago el análisis hacia abajo. Noun phrase subject, verb phrase, verb, y creo que es una prepositional phrase like this. Creo, hay que revisar qué es like. Lo importante, si puedo o no puedo borrarla, si no puedo borrarla, me refiero, ay, pesado. A la adjective clause. Si no la puedo borrar, es obligatoria, es complement. Si la puedo borrar, es post modifier. Veamos una con post modifier. Old Professor Legree, who dresses like a teenager, is going through his second childhood. Okay. Um, is going through, I believe is the verb phrase verb. Going through is a phrasal verb. Going through what? His second childhood. Who is going through his second childhood? Old Professor Legree, who dresses like a teenager. Yes, the who dresses like a teenager. Ahí está. Verbo, sujeto, like this. Old Professor Legree is a name, noun head. This is the noun phrase subject. Who dresses like a teenager. Adjective, clause. ¿La puedo borrar o no? Sí, la puedo borrar. Cumple dos funciones, dos razones por la cual, por cual la puedo borrar. Primero, porque si la borro, no cambió tanto 
el significado de la palabra, no es esencial, de la palabra, de la oración, perdón, chiquillo, no es esencial. Y segundo, porque está escrito entre comas. Así que esta es post modifier. Les pido entonces la comparación. entre uno y otro. ¿Alguna duda? Profe, entonces hay que fijarnos más que nada que no cambie el sentido de la oración o que no la cambie tanto. Que no la cambie tanto, porque caché que si en la primera, si saco el who dresses like a teenager, no se entiende, uno pensaría otra cosa, po. pensaría que las personas viejas son objeto de ridículo. Y por ejemplo, como la segunda está entre comas, ¿es posible siempre sacar la oración así? Decir, oh, ¿está entre comas? ¿Puedo sacarla? Mira, si está entre comas, la hiciste. Eso quiere decir que es información extra. Pero ah, muchas gracias. veces no ponen las comas. Ya, gracias, profe. Ok. ¿Más dudas? ¿Estamos? Maravilloso. Vamos a terminar terrible temprano entonces. Qué bueno. Último. Adverb clauses. <coughs> Las adverb clauses son las dependent clauses que hemos visto todo el tiempo y son esas que parten con la subordinate conjunction, ¿sí? Y que si se ponen adelante de la independent clause, las separamos por una coma. Adverb clauses. A dependent clause that functions, that functions as an adverb in a sentence is called adverb clauses. Cuando digo they function as an adverb es cuando ellas funcionan como adverbiales en el valency pattern. An adverb clause, like an adverbial, modifies a verb, an adjective clause, or an adverbial clause in a sentence. It modifies, that is to say, they describe the situation in, in the main clause in terms of time, frequency, how often, Cause and effect, contrast, condition, intensity, or to what extent. Importante, the subordinating conjunctions used for adverbial clauses or adverb clauses are as follows. So, if you see an adverb, an adverb clause that begins with the subordinating conjunction when, then it's an adverbial of time. If you, if you see If you see an adverb clause which begins with the subordinating conjunction because, then is an adverbial of cause and effect, and so on and so forth. Okay. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this example. He takes medicine because he is ill okay and i'm going to provide the analysis takes is the verb phrase who takes he takes what does he take medicine why because he is ill round brackets noun phrase subjects verb phrase verb noun phrase object and this is an adverb clause adverbial. I'm going to provide the analysis, pra, uh, pronoun head, verb head, medicine, noun head, and because is my subordinating conjunction, and now the phrases, verb phrase, subject, subject complement, right? Noun phrase subject, Pranam head is verb phrase, verb, verb head, ultima, ill. Adjective phrase, subject complement, because it's providing information about he, made out of the adjective head. And that's it. Let's remember then that Uh, you can move them, right? Adverbials, you can move them. So what, what might happen if I put the adverb clause at the beginning, right? It will happen this, or this will happen. 
this will happen. Right? As I can move them, I can I can put them at the very beginning, right? So when I say because he is ill, right? Um you you must separate or you have to separate the adverbial from the from the independent clause by using a comma. And that's it. Alguna duda? Profe, yo no entendí por qué es un adverb. Porque en los valency patterns, valency patterns, tenemos unidades que generan un valency pattern, ¿cierto? Sujeto, tenemos el verbo, tenemos el objeto, tenemos el complement, Y tenemos el adverbial. <coughs> ya. El punto es este. Una dependent clause una dependent clause puede volverse un adverbial en una cláusula. ¿Cómo pruebo eso? Aquí está. Porque este valency pattern es S, B, O, A, donde A es una dependent clause. ¿Qué nombre le damos a esa dependent clause que puede volverse un adverbial en una, una cláusula? Le damos el nombre de adverb clause. No sé si le queda claro. Sí, profe, gracias. ¿Cachai? Es porque se vuelve un adverbial del, del valency pattern. Entonces, en este otro valency pattern, eh, la adverb clause es adverbial y todo queda igual, pero con la A adelante. Ahí está el sujeto, verbo, objeto. Entonces, el valency pattern de esto es A, S, B, O. ¿Cachai? Eso se puede hacer, sí, porque la adverbial se puede mover. Esta. Esa se mueve. Las otras no se mueven. ¿Alguna duda? Ya. Les voy a mandar esto entonces, ya que están ágiles y rápidos. Todos esos los necesito analizados. De hecho, están marcados y todo, ¿ya? Son exactamente los mismos del PPT. Son las 14.50. Les voy a dar 30 minutos para hacerlos todos. Así que 14.50, un break de 10 minutos. Las 15, a las 15.30 las 15 nos volvemos a juntar, ¿vale? Solo envío de inmediato, nos vemos a las 15.30. Estamos grabando. Ok, uh, so let's do it. One by one. What you said made me laugh. Ese ya lo hicimos, era el ejemplo. Eh, vamos a partir con la tercera, que es la que no hemos hecho. Now I realize what you would have thought. Ok. Um, in red. The verb phrase, the subject, I realized what, what he would have thought. Okay, vamos a hacerlo más grande porque para tener más espacio. Eso. When, now. So those are the, those are the valence, the elements of the valency pattern. Now is an adverb phrase acting as an adverbial of time. This is a noun for a subject. This is a verb, phrase, verb. And this stuff over here, I realize this. Therefore, 
this is a noun clause acting as an object, right? Inside of it, verbs. Would have thought he. This is the adverb head, the pronoun head, the verb head. What is my subordinating conjunction? He is my noun phrase subject made out of the pronoun head and would have thought is a verb phrase verb with three different verbs, would auxiliary verb, pre-modifier, have the same. Finally thought is our verb head and that's it. Any problem? No, okay. Then um, I met the boy who had helped me. Uh, met would be our verb phrase, who, I, I met who? the boy who had helped me. Okay, so here we have something different. Our noun phrase subject, our verb phrase verb, and this is another noun phrase object. The pronoun head I, the verb head met, the terminal pre-modifier D, boy is our noun head, and then we have our um, adjective clause and some other places they call it relative clauses. In fact, they call it relative clauses. Then I'm going to look for the verb phrase had help, then the subject and then the object. This whole stuff is an adjective. I'm gonna write down the entire name, adjective clause. The question is, do I need it or not? I met the boy. I don't think therefore is a post modifier because it's optional. Uh, who is the noun phrase subject with the pronoun head, the relative pronoun head. Then the verb phrase verb had helped with the auxiliary verb had, pre-modifier as always, and then the verb had helped. And finally me, this is the noun phrase object with the pronoun head and that's it. Uh, let's remember that adjective clo adjective clauses, they work inside of noun phrases, just like the one I already did. Okay. Prof, una duda. Dígame. Ahí era adjective porque no había un pronombre, ¿cierto? No, es, se llaman adjective clauses, uh -huh. se llaman adjective clauses porque son post modifiers adentro de una noun phrase. Por eso se llaman adjective clauses. ¿Ya? Las adjective clauses pueden estar hechas de dos formas, diría yo. Dos formas. Así como, eh, vamos a ver un ejemplo muy malo, son dos ejemplos malos, pero a ver si acaso funciona. Eh, puede tener esa, ahí, esa WH word, who he, así, algo, algo así. Entonces, en ese caso, como hay pronombre, este sería mi noun phrase subject y este who sería una subordinating conjunction. Esa es una forma que puede aparecer. La otra forma es la que vemos ahí, donde tengo who y después un verbo. Entonces este who de aquí, lo que está haciendo es el noun phrase subject porque ese who es un pronombre. Eso es. Y las ambas dos si están adentro de una noun phrase, son adjective clauses. Como la que vemos acá. ¿Cachai? Que está adentro de una noun phrase. Esa noun phrase. Entonces la adjective clause en azul. Está ahí para contarme cómo tengo que entender ese noun head que está ahí. Que es boy. ¿Cachai? ¿Se entiende? Sí, profe, gracias. Okay. Eh, an apple that smells bad is rotten. Esa ya la hicimos, así que nos vamos a saltar a la que sigue. The book which I like is help. Ah, también la hicimos. Nos vamos a saltar a la que sigue. The house where I live consists of four rooms. Okay, so 
the house where I live consists of four rooms. It consists of four rooms. Therefore, here I have a noun phrase subject. Consists is my verb phrase verb of what four rooms. This is a prepositional phrase subject. The house, and here I have, do you know what? I'm going to change the colors for the for this course. I live, therefore, this is an adjective clause. Question, do I need it or not? The house consists of four rooms. The house where I live, I think is post modifier. It is made of three things, my subordinating conjunction where, my noun phrase subject I, and finally, my verb phrase verb leave. And then all the rest is normal. I'm gonna do it anyway. Verb head of is my prepositional phrase with my preposition head and my noun phrase complement. Four as a number is a determiner. Remember all numbers are determiners. Pre-modifier and this is my noun head. And that's it. In green, you can see the adjective head, the adjective clause, perdón. Let's move on. The person who was shouting needed help. Está más difícil porque sale needed. Oh no, the person who was shouting needed help. He, she needed help. See, sí. no, era igual de fácil. Este es my noun for a subject. Esta es mi verb phrase verb. Needed what? Help. This is a noun phrase object. The easiest part, noun head, verb head. And now the article is a determiner, pre-modifier, person is a noun head. And in green, the adjective adjective clause do i need it the person needed help the person who was shouting needed help i think who was shouting is the final person right uh, therefore i believe you can't erase it um okay was shouting this is the verb phrase and this is the subject so just choose two things this is the noun phrase subject made out of the pronoun head and then we have the verb phrase verb made out of was and then shouting. And that's it. He takes medicine because he is ill. Eso ya le hicimos. Although he tried a lot. <clears throat> He couldn't climb up the tree. Okay. Uh, verb phrase, he couldn't climb up. Climb up, I believe climb up is a phrasal verb, but I might be mistaken. But I think he's climb up. This is my verb phrase verb. He is my noun phrase subject. What the tree? This is my noun phrase object. And then in green, I have my adverb clause. Right. How do I know it's an adverb clause? Because I can move it and because it is separated from the independent clause by this comma. The, and this is my adverb clause performing the role of adverbial, although it's my subordinating conjunction. And then he tried how much? A lot. Right. So this is a noun phrase subject, really fast and easy, pronoun head. This is a verb phrase verb, really easy as well. And I believe a lot is one thing and it's an adverbial. It's an adverb, therefore it would be an adverb phrase adverbial. 
and made out of another head. The rest of the the rest of this is really straightforward. I have my pranam head, my auxiliary verb, pre-modifier, climb up. I believe is a phrasal verb, therefore one single verb, verb head. And the tree is a determiner and then a noun head. And that's it. Um, the other one is the very same pattern. Unless you study for the test, you study for what? For the test, prepositional phrase, noun phrase, complement. You, verb phrase, can't pass what? It. Therefore, noun phrase subject, verb phrase, ver oh, verb phrase, verb. Noun phrase subject, and the other one is an adverb clause acting as an adverbial with the subordinating conjunction. Let's remember that subordinating conjunctions are the ones are the ones which are going to link the dependent to the to the independent. You would be my noun phrase subject made out of a pronoun head. Study is my verb phrase verb made out of a verb head. And for what? For this, for the test, prepositional phrase object. And here we have the prepositional phrase analysis. Noun phrase complement with determiner pre-modifier and then with the noun head. Finally, we have two, the last one is the more interesting, I think, but it's quite fast and easy to know that uh, this is the, this is the adverb because it was blackened, right? Unless it rains, right? We'll go where to the school, prepositional phrase, noun phrase complement, sujeto. Noun phrase subject, verb phrase, verb, prepositional phrase will go there, adverbial of place. And the other one is a, an adverb clause acting as an adverbial, unless it's my subordinating conjunction. It is my noun phrase subject, pronoun head, reigns is my verb phrase verb, verb head, and then all the rest, which is quite a straightforward as well. Pranam head. Flavia, dígame. Eh, profe, tenía una duda de que el adverb clause es el que se puede cambiar y se entiende igual la oración. Las adverb clauses son las que se mueven adelante o atrás y se entiende igual. Y los adjective clauses son los que no se pueden mover. Son las que están adentro de las noun phrases. Mm -hmm. Ah, ya. Yeah. Eso era. Gracias. Yeah. Okay. And here I have my preposition head, noun phrase complement, the school, the terminer, pre modifier, noun head. Última. As long as you drive carefully. Why I believe this is more interesting? Because of the subordinating conjunction. The subordinating conjunction is a multi-word unit as long as, and the three, though these three things are the subordinating conjunction. Okay, uh, then the noun phrase subject, pronoun head, verb phrase verb, verb head, adverb phrase, adverbial, because how, right? With the adverb, Head. This is an adverb clause acting as an adverbial, and then we have the other one. You are safe. Noun phrase subject, verb phrase verb, safe is an adjective. Adjective phrase, subject complement, pronoun head, verb head, and finally 
adjective head. Preguntas sobre lo que acabamos de ver, chiquillos. ¿Alguien, alguna duda? Profe, yo. Dígame. ¿Los adverb phrases siempre van a ser adverbios? Adverb phrases siempre son adverbios. Uy, oh, buena pregunta. Eh, wow, 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 wow. Te diría que sí, 80%. Estoy yeah. pensando cuándo no. Estoy pensando cuándo. Cuidado con las adverb phrases. Acuérdense que adentro de una adjective phrase puede haber una adverb, puede haber, pueden haber adverbios. Voy a dar un ejemplo. Eh, very beautiful. No. Adentro de las adjective phrases hay adverbios. Sí. Very beautiful. Beautiful. Esa cosa, very beautiful. Es una adjective phrase, ¿cierto? La palabra más importante es un adjetivo. Y ese adjetivo tiene very, que es un adverb, primodifier de beautiful. Ya, ahí no hay adverb phrase. Eh, ¿Qué más puedo decir? Puedo ser muy rebuscado y decir very, very beautiful. ¿Qué es eso? Los dos very, los dos están modificando beautiful, así que tamp tampoco hay adverb phrase. Es un adverb primodifier, adverb primodifier, adjective. Hay una cosa que se... Hay, podéis tener una adverb phrase con dos adverbios adelante, así como very rapidly, very rapidly, pero sería una adverb phrase y también sería adverbial. Sí, estoy como en el 95% de que siempre son adverbiales. Ya, yeah, profe, gracias. Ok. Francisca, profe, en cuanto a los adjective clauses, ¿cuándo son complemento y post modifying? Son complementos cuando los necesito para entender de lo que están hablando. O sea, que si los saco, la oración ya no dice lo mismo. Y son post modifying cuando yo los puedo sacar y no cambia el sentido de la oración. Segundo, son post modifying cuando están escritos entre comas. Pero cuidado, no siempre están escritos entre comas. Eso, Francisca. Más dudas, Gracias, profe. Okay. Más dudas, más dudas, más dudas. Este es el momento. Profe, eh, cuando usted dice eh, pronoun head o ver head, ¿siempre hay que ponerle el head al final? ¿O sí, solamente po podemos ponerle? Ah, sí, ¿sabéis pues por qué? Porque podéis tener esto. Podéis tener... Estoy buscando un noun que modifique un noun. ¿Cómo es eso? Quiero, usualmente son como, como muebles. Eh, bedroom, bedroom chair. No sé, uy, qué malo el ejemplo. Ah, sí, desk chair. Si ves eso, eso es una noun phrase. ¿Cierto? Desk chair. Es un muy mal ejemplo, perdón. Desk chair, por ejemplo. Entonces yo te digo ya, ¿cuál de las dos palabras es la más importante? Desk o chair. Siempre, el último, siempre es el último noun. Chair es la más importante. Entonces si tú no me dices cuál es el head, cuál es el más importante, yo no sé qué hace el otro. Pues. ¿Cachai? Lo que me estás diciendo aquí que esta palabra es la más importante y que esta palabra nos ayuda a entender esta palabra. En otra forma, busquemos un ejemplo que tenga estas palabras, una frase, para mostrarte cómo funciona. Ya, yeah, four rooms, ¿cachai? Four rooms. ¿Cuál es la más importante? Rooms. Por eso es el head. ¿Cierto? Y ese for me dice cómo tengo que entender rooms, ¿cachai? Por eso lo modifica y como está antes, es un primodifier. ¿Cachai? Si no me sí. dices, lo que va arriba es la forma y lo que, va, lo que va abajo es la función. ¿Cachai? ¿Qué forma tiene? Noun. ¿Qué función cumple? Es la más importante, es head. Y funciona siempre, siempre es igual. 
esta de acá, ¿qué forma tiene? Prepositional phrase. ¿Y qué función cumple? Object. ¿Cachai? Siempre hay que entregar los dos. Ya, gracias, profe. Ok. Más dudas, más dudas, más dudas. Esto es la cátedra. Profe, te tengo una duda. A mí todavía se me confunden lo que son las noun clauses con las adjective clauses. Ya, las noun clauses, las noun clauses, podemos hacer un símbolo también, también la hacen así, NCL, noun clause, ¿ya? Las noun clauses van a tener dos funciones. Como sujeto o como objeto. ¿Cachai? O sea, en un valency pattern, S, B, O, ¿cierto? S, B, O, estas son las funciones, ¿cierto? Ahora, ¿qué puede cumplir esa función? La verb phrase siempre es una verb, pero ese sujeto puede ser una noun phrase, eso lo sabíamos de antes, pero ahora te, te cuento que puede ser una noun clause también. ¿Cachai? Y el objeto, lo mismo. Por eso se llaman noun clauses, porque reemplazan noun phrases. No sé si te queda claro. Sí, profe, gracias. Entonces la pillería Iron es esta, mira. What you said made me laugh. Ya, yo la leo. Chuta, ya veo dos verbos y los dos están juntos, ¿cierto? Ahí hay uno, ahí hay otro. Chuta, ya, pero ¿cuál es el verbo principal? Pues para poder sacarle el valency pattern. Ya, pero yo sé que adelante del verbo hay un sujeto, ¿cachai? Entonces, por ejemplo, por ejemplo, made, you, what you said made me laugh. ¿Puedo decir it made me laugh? Sí, pues sí, puedo decir it made me laugh. Lo que hago, pruebo que esta cláusula funciona como un noun y por eso lo puedo cambiar por un pronombre. It made me laugh. Ah, esta cuestión entonces es una noun clause. Y ese es el sujeto. ¿Cachai? Esa es la pillería, es cambiar las noun clauses por pronombre, porque son las únicas que se pueden cambiar por pronombre. Eso. Más dudas, más dudas, más dudas. De esto se trata la cátedra. Ojo. Profe, Dime. pero no, no me quedó claro lo me, ya me quedó claro lo de la noun clause. Ya. Y ahora me, me confundo con las adjective clauses. Ya, las adjective clauses están adentro de las noun phrases. Eso es siempre, ¿cierto? Siempre. Ah, ya. Están adentro. Entonces, por ejemplo, para la prueba, para la prueba. Ya, supongamos que aquí hay una noun, una noun phrase. No sé lo que tenga adentro, da lo mismo, ¿cachai? Y, este, y aquí adentro, como post modifier, siempre va a estar la adjective clause. Puede ser post modifier o complement pero siempre está después del noun head. ¿Cachai? Piénsalo así. Ponle un who a algo y está ahí. Juanito, coma, who is my friend. ¿Cachai? Ya, yeah. y esa es la adjective clause. Al tiro. ¿Por qué? Porque este who es el que, la, el que te obliga a meterle la adjective clause. Profe, básicamente le agrega información, ¿no? Mira, usualmente son como pocas las palabras que, porque el whichever, whenever, es tan difícil es que salgan, salen, pero es difícil. Usualmente, usualmente, who, which, when, where, that, esa. Chile, where there are a lot of Earthquakes is thin. Y el where te marcó el tiro. Ahí está el adjective clause. ¿Cachai? Más encima la borra ahí. Chile is thin. Hagamos la mitad. Chile, y mira, ¿cachai? Está como lo digo. Chile, le doy el espacio para la coma mental. Where you can find many beautiful sightseeing. Sightseeing. Creo que así se escribía. Me equivoqué, no se escribía así. Es sin T. No, landscapes. Ya, yeah, la más fácil. 
landscapes is thin. Okay. Chile, where you can find many beautiful landscapes, is thin. Yes, and where? Te inventa el tiro la adjective clause. ¿Por qué está dentro de la noun phrase? Porque cuando le meto el pronombre se, se borra todo. It is thin. ¿Cachai? Por eso está dentro de la noun phrase. Más dudas, chiquillos. Profe, eh, ¿cómo podemos ir en la cátedra? ¿Cómo vamos a poder identificar cuando termine un adjective close o un adverb close? Ya, yeah, es fácil. Los adverb closes se mueven. ¿Cachai? Sí. Ya, yeah. entonces lo voy a tomar, lo voy a leer y lo voy a mover adelante. I will go to the school unless it rains. Ya. Yeah. Voy a tomar unless it rains, lo voy a poner adelante y lo voy a leer de nuevo y tiene que significar lo mismo. Unless it rains, coma, I will go to the school. Ah, listo, ese era el adverbial. Los adverbiales se mueven. Así en tu cabeza, los adverbiales se mueven. ¿Ya? Y donde termina la adjective clause es que tienes que reemplazar la noun phrase por un pronombre. Chile, where you can find many beautiful landscapes, is thin. It is thin. ¿Cachai? Eso quiere decir que ese it reemplaza desde Chile hasta landscapes. Esa es la noun phrase. Ya. Yeah. Gracias. Ya. Yeah. Noelia. Eh, profe, mi pregunta es más como conceptual. Eh, ¿Sí? ¿Se podría dar una definición que distinga la subordination y conjunction coordinators yeah subordination means the process where you put together you join you link a dependent clause to an independent clause which means that you are joining two elements of different levels Right, because the independent clause is at one level and the dependent clause belongs to another level, right? For example, for example, uh, for example, I'm thinking, of, no, no, that, that would be, that would be. Joining, subordination means joining, putting together, linking, gluing an independent clause to a dependent clause. That's subordination, okay? at different levels. Coordination is linking at the same level. That is to say, an independent clause with an independent clause, a dependent clause with a dependent clause, a noun phrase with a noun phrase. You see? So they are at the same level. Which means in, in, in technical, technical terms, coordination, is paratactic, which means at the same level. And subordination is hypotactic. Which means at different levels. That's it. I see. Muchas gracias, profe. Okay. Más dudas, más dudas, más dudas, más dudas. ¿Estamos entonces? Estamos entonces. Ya. Dejo de compartir.